Good evening, everyone. Tonight, the part of Henry Fortunato will be played by me, Katie Mediator Stover, a fellow New Yorker. And uh, like Henry, I'm originally from New York, and we actually grew up some years apart, not as many as he likes to tell you, and some miles distant from, but very close, very close by on Long Island. So it's in my DNA to be drawn towards urban poets like Stanley and Janet Banks. I've lived in Kansas City for quite some time now, and before that, in Kansas City, Kansas. So these days, I favor urban poets with a local flavor and a local sensibility, a local street sense. Which brings us to tonight's reading by Stanley and Janet Banks, who are going to give us what amounts to a oh, husband and wife tag team poetry slam kind of reading for you all this evening. Janet, who believe it or not, believe it or not, once worked for Hallmark, writes poetry that is edgy and raw, and her second collection of poems, On the Edge of Urban, offers a brutally honest look at the women in her life and the women who cross her path. So I'm hoping that you listen to her with an open mind and open ears. Um, I will let you know that if you feel a bit disturbed, that's kind of what Janet's going for. She's using poetry to talk about common experiences prevalent in the lives of women, particularly urban women. And it's not always sweetness and light, as, as urban women know. Stanley is that rarity in the world. He's a working poet. He's an assistant professor of English and artist in residence at Avila University. He's won the Langston Hughes Prize for Poetry and a fellowship from the National Endowment for the Arts. Blue Issues is his fifth book of poetry. And the selections in this volume have that, have that feel of jazz music. So the words might be a little, sh little softer than what you find in Janet's works, but it's the syncopation that's sharp and smooth and unexpected, and that's what good jazz sounds like. So that's what you'll hear in Stanley's poetry. Both Janet and Stanley are terrific readers. You're in for a treat this evening from both of them. And if you're so moved to keep the memories alive and take that poetry home with you, On the Edge of Urban and Blue Issues are both for sale over there at that table. And Stanley will be manning the table while Janet reads first. And both of them will sign their, their works after the reading. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Janet and Stanley Banks. Janet will read first. Thank you all. I appreciate you all coming tonight and just want to say hello and how are y'all doing? Good. Um, as Katie said, the title of my book is On the Edge of Urban. And I thought about urban life. Um, urban life is, can be a beautiful place and that's where I came from. And with its beauty, it also has issues and problems. And when I thought about On the Edge, I thought about the world as I see it being slanted, upside down, tilted, sideways. And it's about attitudes and politics and just plain old living. And that's where I came up with On the Edge of Urban. The first poem I'm going to read is about double standards that plague women. And it's called The Cat Chase, Women's Funky History. Women are taught to be coy in the womb. Men speak freely about their sexual prowess, whip things out like guns blasting targets of cat. The sex closets that women hide in pop out with their panties smoking, keep them closed mouth about their lying lust, while men's braggadocio is always on display. With their locker room conversation, women can kiss it, but not tell it, and if they do, the women who were baby girls hear the whispers of their mothers telling them to keep their legs twisted tight and their lips clamped shut. 
The Cat Chase, Women's Funky History. Thank you. The second poem is, as, I want, as a woman, and I know as women, we all understand what it means to look good and all the things that it takes to look good. And the title of this poem is The Price of Beauty. Two hot Marcel irons resting in a cradle of fire. My hair fell on the floor. As I sat in a swivel chair with the television on, Jerry Springer and Jenny Jones discussing gossip and sex. As my beautician cackled, I smelled burning skin. The Marcel iron touched my ear making a sizzling sound. I jumped up with tears flowing. The smell was like cooked gristle. The brown lump of skin dangled while I winced in silence. I allowed her to poke me in the eye when she washed my hair and scorched my scalp with lye from a relaxer. I was ashamed of my natural hair, and I didn't care because the price of beauty is a bitch. <laughs> and this is another one, um, and it's always something that we can control. We always try to control things around us. And, there, and we know that there's a lot of things that we can't. One thing that I know that I could control was my hair. And that's what I did. But this poem is titled, Hair Stration. Hair short one day, colored the next, wave sprayed, hardened by gel and controlled, not a strand out of place with chaos all around. She was depressed and pissed off because the hairdos got to get done. She couldn't manage any of that cause everything else was falling down. Comfort was trying to look golden. Food couldn't do it. A movie didn't do it. Frustration was a common denominator. A pat and a hat might work. Red and blonde, fried, dyed, laid to the side, curly, frizzy, Relax, straighten, Afro style, dreadlocks, tightened until the brain was squeezed. Something had to give. The stress of hair was too much to handle with scissors in hand. She gave up the ghost to get rid of hairstration. <laughs> Thank you. This is a poem about how generations differ. I mean, you know, it's amazing how um, a generation's 10 years, and it's amazing what a decade can mean to, from one person to another. But this is titled Twisting It. Hula hooping and gyrating to Martha and the Vandella song dancing in the streets, throbbing out the radio. We shook our little booties, my sister and I while my great aunts looked on with raised eyebrows and curled up lips. They scolded our mother. Why do you let them dance like that? My mother argued back. If I don't let them dance here, they'll be twisting it out there in the streets. Twisting it. This is what happens when you overindulge and can't stop. My neo soul addiction. My skin convulses to the sound of chords, notes and pings of an acoustic guitar with saxophone screaming in my head causing me to swirl my hands like a mad conductor. My body gyrates to a song by Minnie Riperton, who I play over and over again, followed by Nelson Rangel, Jill Scott, and Erica Badu. I'm strung out like a broken bass guitar. I need a fix for my moods. It's my stimulant, my cocaine and crack that percolates my soul and keeps me fiending for more. When I, was, when I want a downer, I slit my wrist with cold train and mingus. 
I need to be high as a redwood to float into a sublime submission with a syncopated backbeat reverberating until I overdose with my grooves worn. I jerk in and out of rhythm, looking around for the next puff of voices. Snort something cool from the reed of instrumental melodies. Is there a place for music addiction? Hi, my name is Janet, and I'm an addict. The group of fellow addicts greet me in a cappella. <laughs> Thank you. This is a poem that just kind of speaks for itself, and it's titled Family Heirloom. When one thinks of keeping something in the family like a crystal punch bowl with a chip on the edge, a handmade quilt that great aunt Berthina and her chirping ladies, friends sold with love and miles of thread, that told a story. Those priceless pieces got passed down like a pair of old jeans patched at the knees with raggedy bottoms. A rock hard fruitcake in a new can each year and a grandfather clock that had more ding than dong cuts. It was on its way out. Some things were not material. It was the secrets a family whispered about a woman who twirled like a top was polished like silver and rubbed like a genie's lamp in Uncle Raymond's garage. She was a family heirloom, a gossipy treat, and all the men in the tribe had a taste of her. Family heirloom. This next poem is trying to find, it was about trying to find out my purpose in a time, place, and a space. And it was also trying to find myself as an artist. And it's titled, The Search. On a flight to structure, don't think it's for me to be that robot in the blue-gray suits with the shiny gold buttons, opaque hose, and patent leather shoes to participate in that daily dance of allegiance to the corporate world. I'm there for decades like a child of Israel, wandering around lost in a world so tight, unable to express myself, an outcast in that society. I do express myself with a dark body tattoo that won't come off, even if I tried. My hair is my frame. My face is my canvas to paint my masterpiece. My attitude of unpredictability, sometimes even I don't know what to think about myself. My plate, my plight is not in vain. The artist in me will never be structured because I'm on a trip in search of me. Thank you. This is a poem about women we see, we might know, and this is the day we might see this play out. Scruples and decorum are, are kind of lost on these women. And it's titled Sunday Sisters. They switch and sway in the church with their hallelujahs and amens in pink, yellow, red dresses and big brim hats each sitting up front vying for the preacher's attention while the organist plays an up-tempo tune of going to the river to be baptized. As the trays are being passed, the clinking of money sounds like someone hit the jackpot. The preacher rises to deliver his sermon all six feet and three inches of dark chocolate wrapped in a tailored suit with deep dimples and a devilish smirk hypnotizing the Sunday sisters into submission as they all lean forward so he can get a good look at them. <laughs> he scans the row of legs crossed at the knees, some of them slightly gapped. He asks the question, why are you here? From the front row, a husky voice moans, to get some religion and a little chunk of you on the side. Sunday Sisters. <laughs> the 
this is a, a poem that was, um, during the election, it, it was plaguing me. And um, at the same time, you know, I always, I, I go back and forth with the news. And I was watching this really campy movie. And it made me think about all the stuff that was going on. And the campy movie, and the title of this poem is called Piranhas, but with the subtitle, For Tea Party Conservatives. <laughs> they are a vicious clan, sniffing out their prey. They don't see, they sense. If one is caught alone, it pisses in its scales. When they smell blood, they become organized and methodical. The pack comes together to attack anything that gets in their way with sneaky maneuvers. Once they have you open as wide as the Grand Canyon, the slaughter, the slaughter fest starts. They eat their way through all your characters, staying on point, spewing out your true essence as if it were a sporting event. The piranhas circle and churn like well-oiled machines. Only one whiff of blood is needed for the overtaking, and they won't stop until they have gnawed to the bone. Piranhas. For Tea Party Conservatives. And this is a poem about women who try to control everything, and it's called Bitter Bitties for Male Challenged Females. Belittled, befuddled, not at all bedazzled. Mad, mean, bent on beating up on male babes. Brooding, bubbling inside, trying to hide that real brazen attitude. Being the brain of that operation called a relationship, a brawl at breakfast cuz they think they're brilliant. Backstabbing, big mouth, bad, bad, honey browns, lip dragging, throat tickling, know-it-alls because they're a ball-busting barracudas biding time, waiting to bounce on blinded victims, bitter biddies for male challenged females. Thank you. Here is another poem, and this is about a person who taught me so much. He gave me a lot. Um, and he, you know, he gave me this appreciation for art and this art in many forms. And it's, it's, it's really a personal poem to me and it is titled, My Uncle Lewis and Me. Bopping with my Uncle Lewis as he pulls out 33s, dropping them carefully on the turntable. One by one we listen to Miles, giving me an appreciation for jazz. I was an eight year old girl coming of age. My ears perked up hearing the sultry moaning voice of a woman who sounded like she'd been worn down. My soul connected to Nina Simone's as if I were the same person. I closed my eyes and shook to the sound. While holding the album cover, I examined the picture on front as if it were my reflection. My uncle seemed to know that one day I would be a woman who would experience the same drama as Nina Simone, and it would scar me. As a black gay man, he had to hide his real self from his fans, from his friends and family. It crushed me to see the far off stare on his face when he thought I wasn't looking. I didn't quite understand his struggles. I, he knew that I didn't judge him. If he were alive today, I would let him know I had his back, my Uncle Lewis and me. This is a poem that also speaks for itself. Um, I have a problem with people that lie, so there is a need for this, and it's titled Truth. 
The truth is a black eye, a broken nose, and a 900-pound hot pink gorilla in a room in a society that tries to indoctrinate factions of people by blindfolding them with hot lights burning, trapped in a torture chamber, trying to ask questions. Why? What for? How can this or that be? Education is a good thing, right? An unused mind turns into a mushy, sponge-like thing. It's the key to a world of knowing, creativity and imagination to get to and find the truth. It hurts, stings, and opens closed eyes. The truth liberates while ignorance lulls a mind into a coma. Truth sleeps, but eventually it wakes up stretches and blows lies into oblivion, pushing all the fallacies, myths, and urban legends to a small corner in hell. Truth. This is a poem about self-assured behavior, and it's titled, Swagalicious. <laughs> a natural swing and flow of his arm, a drag of his left foot with a smooth move, a groove scratching the concrete while stepping to a beat in his head. Whether in public or at home, the swag is in his skin, like the hair that stands on end when a cold wind blows. He doesn't even know he has that walk. It's a too hip for the room kind of walk. He's humble, keeping it under control. His style is charismatic as he blows your mind. He can't deny his swagalicious thing that cannot be copied, even if it was cloned. Swagalicious. Thank you. This is another poem that was very personal to me, and these two people who were so wonderful in my life are no longer here. And I realized this particular place that was really, really a good place until I got out into um, the world. But I titled it Sugar Mountain for Mama and Daddy. Without a care in the world, a little black chocolate-faced girl with her huge eyes dancing and shaking by herself. In her own space back then, an independent soul was sheltered and spared from the world out there. Deep inside was an adventurous nature with her mama by her side who had a spiritual voice that put the fear of God in her, keeping her humble and showing her who's boss when she had an attitude. Her mother fought to make her into a decent woman. Her father demonstrated stability, protecting her from teenage pregnancy, dope, and alcohol. She thought they were both out to ruin her life, but the real world was a shock to her system. Now, at night, she sleeps well, remembering how she had it made on Sugar Mountain. Thank you. This is a relationship poem. I know we all have relationships, broken relationships, relationships that are good, but this one was special, and it's titled Free. He was a weed-smoking, cocaine-snorting, case of beer-drinking, giant bowl of cereal eaten while sitting in front of the television watching cartoons, video game playing boy, who liked to toy with women like they were blow up dolls until he got tired and threw them away. But the tables got turned when one of the women he tore down broke his heart, made him cry and said bye bye. He finally realized what he had and got mad when she moved on to better days. He kept trying to patch things up by taking her temperature, 
asking how the new man was. He would say, how is Mr. Wonderful? She would crack back, better than your ass. <laughs> By then, she was free to be, to be the woman she was supposed to be, free. I'm going to read a, a new poem of mine that I am actually working on a series of the seven deadly sins. And this will hopefully be in my new book. And if I can find it, that would be great. Sorry about the delay. Thank you. In the meantime, I will read a poem. And all I can say is, is she joking? And it's titled, Politic Trick for Sarah. <laughs> a sprinkling of smiles was all we saw with square rimless eyeglasses shapely legs and high heel pumps prancing from one corner of the country to another. Political bamboozling, backbiting, pandering, smirking with red lipstick on, pimping out her family to the world and perverting unknowing victims who straddle the line, turning them into rebels of stupidity. Everyone will always remember her as a wolf shooting looking at Putin on a plane, can't speak a straight sentence, President Obama bashing, Tea Party hustler. <laughs> Thank you. This is a poem, can't find the other one. Well, actually, here it is. I found it when I wasn't looking for it. This is a poem, like I said, about a series that I'm working on about the seven deadly sins. And it is called The Glutton. Gorged on crime, sex, porn, and can't get enough. A belly full of hate that's moving up her esophagus, spewing chunks of despise, indignation, and wickedness, leaving a bitter, vile taste in her coated, pinkish, gray tongue. She's willing to inhale all the devastation and tragedy until she fills up on more trash than a landfill. Constipated from all of society's woes, like the poor, the homeless, the downtrodden, along with the scathing scum of the earth. She wants to gobble them up until her seams start to burst, and when she finally blows, chaos will take hold like a leech, draining all the life out of this dreadful world, giving gluttony a severe case of diarrhea, a drainage of mess that will spill down through the ages until she turns back until the dust that she was created from, the glutton. And I am going to actually leave you, this is my last poem, I'm gonna leave you with, um, this poem is, it kind of throw, it kind of throws people off because of the title. And it is Chain Reaction, the original jam. A chain reaction calls in the mind as words piled on top of each other. Verbs started the wreckage, had run amok. Nouns were roughed up and slapped out of their babbling because they didn't make sense. The word police rounded up all the words because they were broken and limping with dangling participles. Some had to be resuscitated, but died anyway. Mangled words were unrecognizable and suffered from onset amnesia, 
The mind that caused the catastrophe couldn't shake the hit and run verbs into submission. They wouldn't cooperate with the nouns, pronouns, adjectives, and adverbs. They committed language manslaughter and had to be escorted to prison. They were escorted by curse words, backbiting words, and character assassinating words. If verbs weren't such in a hurry trying to move so fast by relying on the nouns, pronouns, adjectives, and adverbs, they wouldn't be in the word jam. Maybe verbs should get away to rewrite themselves in a school of art and have some time to think about the use of hasty words and how they affect meter, structure, the lyrical nature of a song, the sonnet, ballad, or free verse. One day, the verbs will heal and get back to a flow of potent poetry. Chain reaction, the original jam. Thank you. And without further ado, my husband, Stanley E. Banks. All right, all right. How's everybody? You good? All right. Janet's a troublemaker, as you know. So. Um, here we go. Ain't no love in the heart of the city. Ain't no love in this part of town. Ain't no love in the heart of the city. Ain't no love in this part of town. Yeah, that's where I began. 10th and Vine Street. Um, boy, I've been doing this for so many years. <laughs> Several decades. Um, and I'm gonna give you some old stuff, some new stuff. Uh, this is book number five. It's, you know, I'm nobody more shocked about that than me. Um, but this is about a place, uh, Mr. Kemper asked me earlier what, I, I got six sisters and a few of them here tonight and uh, got my friends. Um, but I was born in a place um, that really was the definition of Kansas City, Vine Street. Um, my grandmother, as you're going to hear, was a Kansas City bootlegger. She carried two pistols, slept with one to the day she died, literally. She knew Charlie Parker, uh, knew a fellow, I don't know what happened to this guy, uh, Harry Truman, somebody. Um, <laughs> And a fellow by the name of Count Basie. Um, one day I came home, I was excited about learning about William Basie. And she quickly, you know, showed me that she was more hipper than I was. She said, oh yeah, I know old Count. She said, you know, you could have been, you know, if, if Count had played his cards right, he could have been your granddaddy. <laughs> and I said, Grandma, you should have made that happen. But, but no, no, I, I love my grandpa, who was a World War I veteran, but uh, I can see myself as Stanley Basie. <laughs> uh, this poem is about, I grew up on 10th and Vine, and in 1970, urban renewal came to Kansas City, as it did to a lot of places in America. Unfortunately, not much was renewed. Um, and I can remember moving in the eighth grade and I went back because I missed the place and there was nothing there but literally lots and lots of empty, you know, dirt, concrete. But there was a door. And uh, I remember thinking about that in my mind and I wrote this poem because the reason why I started writing was because I didn't want anybody to ever not know that there was a real Vine Street. You know, we have 18th, that's cool, but you know, the folks who know Know that Vine Street ran from 7th and Vine, and you know the big place was 12th and Vine. It's not there anymore, right? So Urban Renewal did that, and this door uh, allowed me to go back in my mind. So it's called The Door in the Empty Lot. 
A door with 1020 on it, tilts in an empty lot, no knob or hinges, blank street signs lean at each corner. Standing where a front porch used to be, Jimmy B remembers the time Uncle Blue poisoned his guts with 10 pints of old granddad on a dare. He opens the door, steps into a time when he played all day in wet undershorts, wiped snot from his nose with his shirt sleeves, stole, stole Hershey bars from art store. He yells, hey everybody, the kid's home. Air answers back with a breeze. He turns to leave, hears Fats Domino singing. I want to walk you home. He feels the beat of his grandma's bootleg beer house that shook up Vine Street. Even church folks stopped in to play. His grandma would shout, I know how to do it right. But when he steps back through the doors, it falls, raising dust. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and then one of the many characters you're going to hear me read, uh, talk about tonight, uh, I had this wonderful uncle who uh, was more childlike than any child I ever knew. But I, and I think he did that for me. Uh, he was very tall, um, and he just seemed to know everything that a little boy would know. And, um, you know, you, people ask, well, how do you write stuff? This was my very first poem that ever got published. Um, I found a photograph, and the poem um, tells you about the photograph at the end. It's called Uncle Lori. Me and Uncle Lori stepping through back alleys to see Six Bits the barber, who was always singing. I always made a mess of Ori's comic books. We watched Saturday morning cartoons. Ori would say, you ain't big, just fat cat, and give me Yogi Bear looks. Ori started having all night pain. My folks said he drank too much 7-Up. I thought if that's all, he'll be all right. He left one night in cold rain. Ori was in the hospital three weeks when my grandmother told me her best boy's kidneys busted in his stomach. I stumbled upstairs to Ori's room. My head was hurting. My eyes felt like ice cubes. I sat looking at a picture of me on Ori's shoulders in my blue baby suit. I was slobbering in his hair. Uncle Lori. And uh, you know, I've been teaching for a long time. Um, um, I like to tell people, I've taught every level from elementary school, kindergarten, elementary, uh, where the kids called me uh, after my dog's name, which is King Mudhouse Rock, so they call me Mr. Mudhouse Rock Man. You know, love kids. Middle school, high school, juvenile detention centers, penitentiaries, some of the best poets are locked up, you know, and you know, that, that, that's a joke, but it's like, it's true. Um, and uh, this poem I wrote for a type of kid, not all the kids, but this self-confident thing that uh, our generation used to be jitterbugs back in my father's day, used to be uh, the, the thugs of Tupac's time. And it's just that, that attitude, and I wanted to write about that. And this is uh, uh, that whole thought process. Um, they make those decisions, those bad decisions, and they can't stop. It's called Sweet Brother Lou. Sweet Brother Lou. He lies on the bed, his feet crossed on the wall, couldn't give a damn about 10th grade English. Dreams of a huge slick ride, hot whores close to his hips, New green bills to hustle with. He wants to learn pimp sense, talk in low, mellow, melodic tones. Be smooth as a razor to slide in and out of tight squeezes. He knows if his plan should fail, they take ass in the Jackson County Jail. <laughs> and he don't care. And then, um, you know, there, you know, I stand here, I'm, I'm sure appreciative, thank you all for coming out, because I know you could be doing something else on a Thursday night. Appreciate it. Um, I write a lot, I, I had some critics, you know, been doing this for a long time. They said, you know, Stan Banks, he writes about 
the good, the bad, and the ugly of African-American life. And I'm like, okay, I'll take that. Uh, but it's not just a death thing, because um, there's a lot of blood, a lot of death in my poems. But uh, I'm also trying to show about the life that was and that should be celebrated. Uh, so I wrote this poem, um, which is what happens when that attitude I just wrote about with Sweet Brother Lou uh, turns deadly. Um, it's a poem about a real person. My brother, whose name was Carl, uh, died at 17. So I write this poem uh, with the last part of his life first and the first part of his life last. And it's called Carl. Carl. Blown into two pieces by a blast from a sawed-off shotgun. That's all his family can remember sometimes. Newspaper articles were written as though he were born a vicious street punk. But this fragile gangster with a chip front tooth and ears that seemed bigger than his head never got the chance to mature into a good citizen. In a photograph of him at age four that his mother sleeps with under her pillow, he has vanilla ice cream and snot smeared from chin to forehead while walking gently with a load in the seat of his pants. <laughs> Carl. <laughs> and then um, uh, this is um, apropos, I guess we've got two Supreme Court decisions coming in about with one of the most controversial issues, gay marriage and so forth. Um, you know, boy, the culture wars have been on for a long time, but they're coming to an to a head. Um, and uh, this is a poem about a guy I knew when I was a child and um, I always wondered why he wasn't happy. Um, because he was gay, as everyone whispered. <laughs> so, but he was one of those wonderful characters who I knew on Vine Street growing up. Um, he was a friend and a great guy. And uh, this was published in one of those great uh, literary magazines called Rusty Truck that's online. Um, and we had to write these 129 poems. This came out of that. Clyde's house on 129 Vine. The gossip on the streets was that nasty things go down in his basement at 129 Vine. But on the first floor, Clyde cut black men's hair in his brass barber chair. People whispered, smiled, pointed at Clyde like he was a clown performing for them. Every day his barber chair was filled with laborers, police, and gangsters. None of them seemed to care that nasty things go down in his basement at 129 Vine. <laughs> Clyde greeted his customers with a warmth that most men never show in public to another man. He shaved and lined hair like a painter in the middle of his Vine Street masterpiece. With ease, he quoted the Bible and Langston Hughes, but he couldn't stop the talk of the nasty things that go down in his basement. Clyde. Um, and, um, I was just talking again about the influences uh, that bring you here because my friends, I can tell you honestly, when I was a boy coming up on Vine Street, if you say, what is Lil Stanley going to be, he sure wouldn't be a poet. <laughs> you know, it probably would have been thug, gangster, hustler. Um, and my, I, I had all these wonderful influences and uh, my father was the kind of guy he dreamed big and couldn't quite make it, and he nicknamed all of us. Um, man, by the time we got to first to kindergarten, we didn't know who we were. <laughs> you know, my sister and I, we were in kindergarten the first day. It's a true story. And the teacher, you know how they come around, and say, now what's your name? And people give their name, and he said, is your name Stanley Eugene Banks? And she's behind us, right? We can't see, and I'm looking at my sister Janet. <laughs> and my sister named Janet, too. And then she goes to Janet. She's saying, is your name Janet Lorraine Banks? And I'm looking at her, and we're looking at each other. 
and my sister's name is Bucky. <laughs> my name is Papa Dad, you'll hear about that in a minute. We look at each other, I said, Bucky, I think that's you. <laughs> oh, thanks, Dad. Um, my father never called me by my proper name. My father would yell, Papa, Dad, come here. Introduce me to his buddies by saying, hey, Jitters, this is my little man, Papa, Dad. I asked him once why he called me Papa, Dad. I believed it was because he thought I was mature like a grown man, even though I was only eight. He snapped back at me, I call you Papa, Dad, because you look like an old man with a big head and big ears. I never asked again. <laughs> My nickname was all was a reassur was reassuring until I became a man and understood that a nickname could never replace a father and son relationship. At 45 he died. I never called him father. He was just Georgie to me. And then a poem literally, um, you know, there's strife in families. There's, you know, people have often asked, well, you know, how'd you get to be you? Which is always a crazy question, <laughs> you know. Um, uh, you're blessed, you're lucky, you're fortunate. Um, and there, there are struggles inside the families. You know, uh, families are struggling for economic reasons, all kinds of reasons. But it came to a head with that father of mine who uh, we, you know, I finally became 17 and of course that eventual toe-to-toe -to -toe confrontation happened. Um, and again, my grandmother who, you know, it's funny about grandmothers. If, I guess if you get to be a grandmother, and I'm not talking about these 30 and 40 year old grandmothers either. <laughs> Boy, that's a whole new thing. I started seeing that when I was teaching high school. I'm like, Grand like my grandma's coming. And grandma walk in, grandma, fine. <laughs> like, grandma, you lying. Man, grandma. But I'm talking about grandmas who are 60 and 70, right? There's some grandmas. And a situation occurred, which you're going to hear about in the poem. Um, and again, my name was Papa Dad, my, thanks to my, my dad. Um, and it's about that, that whole omniscient spirit of hers um, that saved my life more than once. Uh, but this was one of those softer moments, but it had the same effect. And I write these poems called Annihilation Poems, and this is one that, you know, you can catch it with the symbolism. Annihilation number 711 for Papa Dad. His grandmother rolled the dice for him when she put her money where her heart was. She bet that he could change, that she could change the destiny of an at-risk child who wet the bed until he was in the fifth grade and talked to nine teddy bears to get inspiration. While his battering father and jitterbug uncle and their drinking buddies bet that he would join them on their favorite corner to turn up a shared bottle, his grandmother insisted that he would be and do better. But he didn't even believe that at the time. On a defining night after his 17th birthday, with the bet on the line, he gripped his father's neck in a murderous clutch and would have killed him his grandmother's son. But in that instant, he heard her soft plea. She called in her marker. And when her grandson released his pain, her gamble for his life paid off twice. Um, I wrote a poem called Dysfunctioning. See your theme? <laughs> dysfunctioning. Um, but it's the opposite of dysfunctional. You with me? Because people say, well, how do you get out? You, you know, you, you, if you live in dysfunction, how do you get out of dysfunction? You know, you got to go to reverse. No, if you, or you got to find some way to, to, you know, get around it, move around it. Well, you know, if you function well in hell, doesn't that make you more hellish? So you, act, you actually have to be the reverse of it. So I wrote a poem called Dysfunction, Dysfunctioning, and it was published in, you know, uh, Ralph Waldo Henderson kind of uh, publication. It was for uh, this publication called Emerson of Harvard. 
and they, they published this poem. So I've, I've got these poems about doing the reverse of what's expected. And this one was a real story, you know, because we writers like to pick up stuff right out of the news. Um, this was a real story. You'll, you'll know, I think, when I tell you, when you hear the, some, the, some of the facts of this. And it's called Dysfunctioning Baby, based on a true event. In the first few seconds of his innocent life, his mother tried several times to flush him down a McDonald's, a McDonald's toilet. But the baby fought against the surge of filthy rushing water, blood, urine, tears, feces, and pieces of umbilical cord streamed by his puny body. But he held on tight with a grace few adults find in a lifetime and learned one of the profound lessons of this lowly existence. When you're born in crap, you can either sink willingly or swim against the tide. This functioning baby. And um, boy, I'd sure like to meet that kid because I bet you he'll be president one of these days. Because who knows when the fight begins, but you must. You must struggle um, for quality in your life. Um, so now, you know, those are some of the, the poems that, that make a person like me become a poet. Um, but oh boy, you know, politics is ever present. Um, what, an event uh, that most people, historians have pointed to, that kind of changed the direction of this country um, uh, in favor of one party against another was an event that uh, happened. It was an anthology, a national anthology, and um, I had uh, a poem published in this anthology. Um, it was Katrina and Rita, The Hurricanes, that really did change the landscape, uh, not only in New Orleans and Mississippi and other places, but it did some stuff, changed some of the ether in America. And this is called um, After Katrina, The Bodies Are Rising. Unjust death can never be contained in a crypt. Bodies rising tend to expose the truth about the remains of Jim Crow days. Atrocities are historic in Louisiana. Ghosts of old Creoles are again trying to speak. Where have y'all been? Why did y'all leave us? We are witnessing the sins of the last century as mulattoes, quadroons, and octoroons rise. Anti-civil rights Dixiecrats never wanted anyone to bother with the horrors that lie just under the surface. How many times will America allow the ugly issue of skin color to hemorrhage, hemorrhage in our hearts? New Orleans, you've always been a showy and jazz mad city. Please, Satchmo, come back and jam with Wynton Marcellus. Blow the life back from smithereens to New Orleans. Oh, Susanna, don't you cry for me. And don't ever forget Emmett Till beating so savagely his mama didn't know him. I'm going to Louisiana, not you, Dred Scott, unless you go back as a slave because the 1857 Supreme Court decision sealed your fate. With a banjo on my knee, President George W. Bush, the bodies are rising. And then we got, a, we got a new term in the lexicon uh, for my dear President Barack Hussein Obama. Excuse me. <laughs> hey. Birthers. Um, you've heard Sarah Palin. Um, I was actually in Sarah Palin territory um, in Wasilla. And let me tell you something, to, for the people of Wasilla, they're wonderful people, they can't help it, that, <laughs> that, that she became who she became. Um, this is for Donald Trump and all the rest, um, this whole notion of birthers. Yeah. Birthers, a decayed reflection. Logical people asked, 
Is a point of view true or false? They don't relish in the perversion of it. Birthers weren't even relieved after forcing President Barack Hussein Obama to show his papers. As in early centuries of American slavery, when Africans were forced to show their papers to pass from place to place, birthers have always been obvious, attempting to hide their true nature with fake outrage, white sheets, now suits and ties, business dresses and Supreme Court robes. Birthers used to rule in a time of plantation owners who cooked up schemes to forever brand and lock in the belief that dark skin equals the identity of a slave who is eternally, eternally alien. Birthers are just a new version of the Ku Klux Klan and Southern segregationists. In the light of day, when a lie can smell as rotten as it is, birthers don't ever want to die because maybe they know that Jesus is tan like Barack Obama. <laughs> I'm just saying. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. Yeah, you know, poets, we like to get in a lot of trouble. So let me continue. The moral pretense. You know, I'm, I'm one of these people. I pay attention. I, I listen. Um, and, you know, um, this is a poem just for, man, how sometimes the truth gets turned a little bit. So this poem is called, and I, I'm, um, the last line kind of says what I, I wanted to say, but. Here we go. Um, birthers and new confederates. This is really who this is for. So this is not you guys. The moral pretense. Old races have forgotten that we're not in the middle of the 19th century anymore. Remember, no colors, no truth, no shame, no conscience. The brand new Puritan, Puritans went ballistic at the sight of Janet Jackson's caramel tit. The preacher, the preach, they preach that we're all sick and sinful in America and pray for the right and tight law, the no tit amendment, <laughs> proclaiming that no body parts should ever be allowed to flop, drop, pop, dangle, or throb. <laughs> Moral pretenders insist that hardcore sex takes place only in Satan's penthouse. They complain ferociously that purity in the bedroom will cleanse our dirty world. And if you don't conform, they'll howl and defile you, insult your character by emotionally gutting and kicking your brains in, leaving you begging and pleading for the true land of free speech with its milk and honey dreams. Maybe the moral pretenders should just go and lick something. <laughs> I'm just saying. And then uh, uh, Janet talked about her hair straightening poem. It's funny, we both, I, I wrote this before Janet's hair straightening poem, but you remember in the 80s, I'm, you know, after all that, I gotta get some, some humor here, you know. I won't be too serious. Um, but this is a serious issue for my African American sisters. Um, that hair thing. Um, in the 1980s, you, some of you all went around, but. You know, the hair was tall, and now when you go to Atlanta and you see these hair shows, they still, boy, they have lights, cars, spaceships, all in the hair. I don't know, it's, it's like, it's that tall hair thing, but the one thing that doesn't change is that hair attitude. A hair attitude. Sisters flow and roll with extra control and much soul. With, with minds, with, excuse me, with behinds that blow minds. But it's their big two-tone hair with multi-level layers that get all the attention, like skyscrapers being balanced with steady, on steady heads and strutting hips. They move with a slow creep on light feet, packing with them an attitude that warns, you can call me sweet nasty names. Hurt my feelings with your games. Just don't touch my hair. <laughs> Just don't touch, baby. Just don't touch. <laughs> you 
And uh, just a few more for you, about four if you're counting. Um, this, I, you know, I can't tell you all. I, I started writing in 78, uh, the great UMKC, give all these shout outs now. You know, went to the great Howard University uh, where I got to uh, meet Robert Mugabe and see Jimmy Carter, all that good stuff. Um, uh, I've had a chance to travel and people always ask, you know, how did you get to be the poet person? Um, I don't know if I have an answer for that, but I know one thing, we all have a gift of some kind. Um, and it's a terrible shame if you let your gift go by. And so this is this blues part of uh, my book. Um, there's a lot of blues. I've got uh, the sections are banking blue, clever banking blue, get it, <laughs> howling blue, and riffing blue. So this is a kind of a riff on, you know, what life, uh, you know, um, a cat may have nine lives, right? But uh, we humans only get one. So uh, as the title says, play that one note you're given. You decide if your one note begins a symphony. Seize it and shimmy your body every night like, like, like every night you live, boogieing like your pants are on fire. And the only way to put them out is with liquid pleasure like those sizzling sloppy kisses on the first night of sleazy sex that leaves your eyes popping, organs quivering, skin and muscles slapping, slamming and pounding with all your limbs floating at the end of your concert. Your note will still be solid with the free will drum beat composed with your pure heart so that no one will ever say Instead of riffing your note, you just let it fade. And then the, the title poem for the book, uh, Blue Issues. Um, you know, there, there's, right away people think, oh, it's, it's down, it's tragic. It's all of that. It's, you know, it's cool blue, it's upbeat blue, it's jazzy blue, it's dark blue, it's all that kind of blue. And I write about all that stuff because blue, you know, blue comedy and, you know, so it's every kind of blue and, and for me that, that covers the spectrum. Um, and the title that's of the book and the poem, Blue Issues. My blue issues mire me in the memory of multi-murders, tighten the knots that have hardened in my shoulders for decades, I've learned to take each strain of my life, examine them, and try to smooth out the frayed places. My blue issues drive me to beat, bang, and riff, trying to reach that Langston Hughes and Sterling Brown high. Sometimes in the black of my night, I'm afraid to look into my mirror because my rage is winning. My blue issues in those times of torment turn me frantic, fearful, and suspicious. I fight back remembering my childhood when the old bootlegger, where the old bootlegger lives forever. My grandmother scolded me. Hold on to the dignity and righteous mind you got and don't ever crawl for anybody. My blue issues jolt me back to my present life. And despite my praying and pleading for them to go away, they never leave. I just want those sweet blues, baby. Those blues that quake me in my shoes. Those sweet blues. Blue issues. And it, this, is a, this is just simply a, a writer's poem. This is the new, new stuff. Like uh, those of you who appreciate a Gwendolyn Brooks or a Langston Hughes, Gwendolyn Brooks' poem, We Real Cool, 24 words, nice, tight. Uh, Langston uses poem Harlem, nice tight rhythm, um, uh, and with that great first line, what happens to a dream deferred? Well, there are words that we writers hang on to. You know, I, I've been raised around some of the best drunks in America. <laughs> and, you know, quite as it kept, drunks can really say some interesting stuff. 
and words become important even to them. Um, and so this word just popped up in my head and I played with the word because we writers like to, you know, do that kind of thing. So a hot shot. The word was shot, right? A hot shot. Junie was born a baby shot, turned into a teen shot, thought he was a big shot, was just an immature shot, labeled a long shot, became an adult shot, succeeded on a bank shot, put on mileage as a middle aged shot, slowed down into an age elderly shot, crippled by a gunshot, checked out and was a done shot. A hot shot. All right, can you stand a couple of more? I figure you're not throwing any tomatoes, so I'm good. Um, just two more poems. The, the one is about um, identity. When, whenever I teach it, I teach at Avila University, the great Avila University. Go ahead, Avila. Go on, shout out. My Avila students. There you go. There you go. All right. There you go. There you go. They think they're getting extra credit, they're not. No, just kidding, <laughs> just kidding. They will. Um, the ideal of identity in African-American culture, it, it runs deep, it's constant. Um, we protect it, we, we, we grapple with it. And so this was a poem uh, that wrote just about the whole ideal of identity. What's that old saying, you know, you don't answer to what you're called, you answer to what you want to be? I paraphrase that, right? So this is called Chain of Events. Africans died colored once, did hard times as spooks, coons, and crows, changed into Negroes, went underground to come back black. Throughout the decades of struggling, we heard the hallelujahs of long gone dreamers who startled and amazed white hooded gray faced mobs by dancing darky dances while swinging in rhythm at the end of a noose. History has taught us that movement after movement tends to tighten the rope. But we've learned to hustle to whatever it takes to get ahead, be Afro-Americans, and shuffle only when getting down on the dance floor. And finally, um, where I start, where I finish, um, Tribute to um, the old bootlegger. Um, it is incredibly important. I've spoken at, you know, I've taught every level. I've spoken at juvenile detention centers, penitentiaries. The ideal of protection, the ideal of security, uh, the ideal of warmth uh, is a constant, even with cold blooded killers and stick up kids. They lament the fact that they didn't have that. So this is a poem where, again, this you know, word just jumped up into my head. I hadn't thought about this idea and my grandmother's connection. But um, there used to be a thing, that uh, checkerboard ice cream. Anybody remember checkerboard ice cream? It was my favorite ice cream that my grandmother introduced me to. So the poem. Um, even after her death, she's uh, uh, profound in my psyche. Checkerboard ice cream memories. Checkerboard ice cream memories. Bootlegging was our family business. On the weekends, my grandmother and I stayed up all night and she told me about her bootlegger battles while I gorged myself on checkerboard ice cream. My grandmother was preparing me for the falls of my life. Like the time Uncle Slick got shot in the head but lived to be smoother than ever. Or the time Uncle Lori and Uncle Bean fought for a bloody hour, collapsed, and started back up the next night <laughs> until my grandmother ended it with two gunshots over their heads, promising them that the next bullets would be in their asses. <laughs> Once all the noise from childish adults was over, my grandmother would again prepare the big rocking chair and warm blanket for me so that I could finish the rest of my checkerboard ice cream. Thank you all. Thank you so much.